wisdom. We talked about knowledge. We talked about uh, uh, the talents varying from person to person. Uh, they're spiritual. They're physical material. Then we talked about the treasure. Uh, you know, eventually we're going to get down to talking about treasure. We haven't said a lot about it, but uh, friend, treasure and giving of our substance is a very, very important uh, thing. You need to know and understand this. Now, I want you to turn with me to this portion of the Bible back in the book of Deuteronomy, and there, Deuteronomy and chapter 8. And you might want to mark this verse and, and consider it uh, because the Bible tells us something that is very, very important. And that is Deuteronomy chapter 8 and verse number 8. And I'm looking at it, and for some reason, uh -uh. I'm, I'm not finding the verse that I want. Uh -uh. Okay, it's verse 18. I forgot the one. Uh -huh. Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 18. But thou shalt remember the Lord thy God, now listen, for it is he that giveth thee power to get wealth that he may establish his covenant which he swear unto thy fathers as it is this day. Now, I ran across that verse when I was a young man, and uh, I never really aspired to be wealthy. Uh, a lot of men do, and I know of young men who determined that by the time they were 25 or 30, they wanted to be millionaires and, and self-sufficient, and they wanted the big money. It didn't really, it wasn't that appealing to me. After God saved me, and I got saved when I was 18, the only thing that I was concerned about was doing the work of God, winning souls, building churches, and, and preparing for eternity. Now, I was uh, married and had a child shortly after that, and I needed work and needed a job, and I get a job, and I wanted to have a good job, and I realized the importance of money. But early on, I came to realize that it is God who gives man power to make wealth. So if you want to be successful in life, please know and understand this. God is not just concerned about your spiritual needs. God concerned about your material needs. And if you have financial needs, God wants to take care of that. You know, in the book of Matthew, in their chapter 6, if you can turn there uh, for a few minutes, there's some really important scriptures that every one of us should know. And he says this in Matthew 6, I'll start reading with verse 25. He says, Therefore, I say unto you, take no thought for your life, what you shall eat, or what you shall drink, or yet for your body, what you shall put on. Is not the life more than meat, and the body than raiment? Behold the fowls of the air, they sow not, neither do they reap, nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. Thus the song I sang this morning, Consider the lilies. Are ye not much better than they? Now verse number 20. And why take ye thought for raiment? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow, they toil, they, do, they neither do they spin. And yet I say unto you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like unto one of these. Wherefore, if God so clothe the grass of the field, which today is, and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore take no thought, say, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or wherewithal shall we be clothed? Verse 33. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Now, verse 33 is another verse that I made one of my life verses. And it basically says, if you take care of God's business, he's going to take care of yours. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things, food, clothing, housing, whatever you may need is going to be provided for you by God. Now my missus and I have uh, lived a life of faith. And we're still living a life of faith. Uh, it was easy when we were young. It is not so easy today. Mm. But it is easy when you're young to step out and say, God shall provide. Mm -hmm. uh, but here's what I found that after all of these years and more than 50 years of preaching the gospel, God has fed us, God has clothed us, God has housed us, and, 
and God has given us transportation, and the Lord Jesus has taken care of us. So I do believe this. I believe God gives man power to make wealth. If you want to be successful, look to God. And uh, I believe that God has taken it upon himself to bear responsibility for us. For he's our Heavenly Father. He feeds the sparrows. He takes care of the flowers of the field. Therefore, he, he, he's vowed that he's going to take care of you and I. We shall have food and raiment and a place to live and all of that sort of thing. He tells us, friend, that in this life, he will care for us. Now, there's another verse in Matthew, and there, chapter 6, that I want to uh, go to as well. And we'll interject that at this point. And I'm hoping you'll write these down and maybe go back to them later and consider uh, what it has to say. But these are very, very weighty and powerful verses. Matthew 6, verses 19 through 21. Jesus speaking, and he says this. Lay not up for yourself treasure upon the earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasure in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, where thieves do not break through and steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Now, as a steward, you have a stewardship of your time and talent and treasure, and you have yourself to provide for, your family to provide for, and there's nothing whatever wrong with working hard, with wanting a good job, a good salary, a good home, a good automobile, and a good living for your family. You ought to go after all of that. Understand this, however, and you need to get this is a big picture. You're only going to be here for a short while. Believe me, it is short. <laughs> I can remember when I was 16. And uh, my grandfather, who was 70, his name was Neil Pate, out of uh, Irving, Tennessee. And uh, granddad was, and I were cutting down a tree. And that old man at 70, he was lean and trim and worked as a farmer all his life. And he wore me out. I was 16 years old. But I said to granddad, I said, granddad, I'm going to tell me, let me ask you some question. Because at that time, God began to deal with me about my soul. And I said, Granddad, you're 70. Do you feel like that your life has gone by very quickly? And he said, well, Bobby, he said, uh, be honest with you, it seems like my life has gone by like a dream. He said, it seems like yesterday I was 16, and now I'm 70 years old. I never forgot that uh, conversation with Granddad, and I realized that whatever life God gave me, I knew it was going to go quick. Here I am into my 76th year. My dentist the other day couldn't believe that. I said to him, Doc, I don't know about all that money on those teeth. I, I'm almost 76. My dad died at 80. And he said, I don't believe that. And uh, I, I, I may not look 76, but I'm almost there. <laughs> and, uh, but here I am, and I can look back at my grandfather and I think now I surpassed him by these many years. And so, friend, more than ever, I realize we're going to be here for a short while. But now listen, you're going to be over there. Now get this, get a, get a hold of this, get on. Here it comes. A thousand years in a millennial reign. That's a long time. How would you like to live to be a thousand years old? You're going to be on earth with the Lord for a thousand years. That's nothing. After that, a new heavenly creation, you're going to be here 10 trillion years, 10 beyond that. Well, the Bible says we shall live forever. Now, would you agree with me that life over there is far more important than what we're doing down here? I mean, listen, a billion years from today, it's not going to matter what kind of house you lived in down here, what kind of car you drove, what kind of bank account you had. But it will matter over there because what you have over there you're going to have forever what I have here is temporal and what you have here is temporal whether it's good or bad if you have looks hold on it's fading if you have strength watch out you're going to lose it if you have youth that's going to be gone before you know it and the wrinkles are going to start showing up and the aches and the pains and all that goes along with it all of this is temporal that's forever now, Jesus said not to lay up all your treasure here on the earth. 
He said, where a man's treasure is, there will his heart be also. Now you're in the world, and you need to make your way in the world. Hope you'll be here a good while. But friend, this is temporal, and your heart doesn't need to be in the world. Your heart needs to be with Jesus. And the wise man is the man that makes an investment. Somebody said, no, no matter how much wealth you have, you can't take it with you. But a wiser man came behind him and said, yes, but you can send it on ahead of time. <laughs> you know, uh, the Bible said, Jesus said, I go to prepare a place for you. And some believe that he's building your house as you send up the material. <laughs> and it's very likely some folk are going to have a cabin in the corner of glory, man. Because you've not set up enough to make the mansion that many will have. If you could ever get a hold of that, it would revolutionize your life. It would help you deal with the problems and the issues that are coming along because you realize whatever it is, this too shall pass and the morning is coming. Just like the crucifixion, the sorrow, the agony, the pain, the remorse when Jesus was dead. But then came the morning and he arose and everything changed. Well. Friend, Jesus said we ought to lay up a uh, treasure in heaven. Now, regardless of whether it is time, talent, or treasure, whatever it is God's given to you and I, please understand, he cares about what we do with what he gave us. Can you understand that? These are treasured gifts. You know... Some people are given such marvelous gifts. I'm thinking right now of Leon Sadler. Leon was a young man, 27 years old, in my church in Maryland back in the 70s and 80s. And he was uh, married and had three beautiful little girls. And Leon was uh, like my son. He was light-skinned and blonde-haired and a very handsome young man. But the most outstanding thing about Leon was he had a voice. You know, all of us have voices, and most of us can sing to some degree, but this boy had what is called a golden voice. We, many times we've been singing in the congregation of Leon, and when he started singing, he rose up above everybody else, and his voice was angelic. And I said to him one day, I said, uh, Leon, son, with a gift like that, I said, you ought to be singing for the Lord and using that talent. I seldom heard. I, no, I, I, I've never heard in the churches a more beautiful voice than Leon had. And I encouraged him to get right with God, to give his voice to the Lord and serve him. Well, Leon got mad at me. And he quit coming to church off and on. I was preaching on a Wednesday night when he should have been in church and I got an emergency call from his family, and they said he's coming from work on his motorcycle when a car hit him. And I walked in, Don and I went to the emergency room immediately, and when we walked in the front door of the hospital, Leon died. He was 27 years old. And Don and I went into the uh, operating room where they were working on him, and the doctor was there, the family was all around, and I looked at that young man stretched out on that gurney. And I could not believe it. And I thought, what a waste. The most beautiful voice about that I'd ever heard. I mean, he was on a par with Ivan Parker and some of these guys. But he would not use it. And I've met so many people along the way that were so gifted. Maybe gifted in other areas. You know, when we founded and built Baptist Bible Church up here back in 74 and 75, uh, I bought that property, we bought it, bought an acre and a half, then we bought 10 acres. Then we had that building built, at least the first edition. And they put up the shell, and then uh, the guys in the church, we said, well, we're going to finish it out. And it took us just a short while to finish that out. We put in the, the carpet, all the electrician. God bless Emily and Charles Singletary, they were our electricians, one through the ministry. They, they, they wired the whole thing for us. Uh, Frank Drummond up, up court. Frank did all our plumbing work. Hey, these guys never charged us a cent. And a pharmacist, a railroad engineer, an insurance salesman, 
A Purdue worker by the name of Bobby Turner and myself, we did all the work inside and finished it out. But here's the sad thing. There were men within that church that there are two men that I'm thinking of that could have done it without our help and done a far greater job, but they could never find time to show up and work and do what got, they were gifted to do, but they wouldn't do it. I've seen that more times than not. Back in those days, uh, we had a bus ministry, and I bought several buses, had them painted white with red trim. And you believe we could not, out of, we had a hundred and, I think the first day we opened the church, we had 175 people in it, and, but we couldn't get a person to drive the bus. Walt Turner drove for a while, but then he quit and refused to drive it. Also, so there are a lot of people that could do, that just don't, and as a result of it, the church really suffers. Friend, one man said, he said, you show me a man's checkbook, and I'll tell you what kind of man he is. Because you can see who he spends his money on, what he spends his money on, how he spends his money, what he does with what God gave him. Many spend it only on self. Some may spend with others. Some give to the Lord, some don't. But dear friend, you can tell a lot about an individual by the time that he spends for God, the time, the talent, and the treasure. Now, God gave it. And my friend, here's something that you need to know and understand. Look with me to the book of Proverbs. There are so many wonderful thoughts and truths in Proverbs. Turn to Proverbs chapter 3. You know, I used to travel around and do evangelistic work and, and concerts and that sort of thing. And believe it or not, I used to have people come up to me and want my autograph. I don't know anybody here on the shore did, but I, every place else I've gone, uh, so folk would come up. And I always use Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 when I sign my autograph, trust in the Lord with all my heart, be not that I understand him. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy path. That's good advice for him. But verse 9 and 10 is what I want you to see this morning, and it's equally as important. Just what it said. Honor the Lord with thy substance, with the first fruits of all thine increase, so shall thy barns be filled with plenty, thy presses burst out with new wine. Now, would you like to have your barns filled with plenty? Would you like to have your presses burst out with new wine? Well, the Bible says... Honor the Lord with thy substance. Now, please know and understand this. Your stewardship in the matter of giving, whether it's time, talent, or treasure, is not for the preacher. It is not for the church. Often people will say, you mean to tell me? And I've had them say, you give all that money to that church? If all you're doing is giving your money to church, you best just keep it. What I give is for the Lord, whether it's my time, my talent, or my treasure. Now, I want to be a blessing to you, therefore, I've devoted my life to music, the ministry, the music, the work, the sermon, and so on. And I want to be a blessing to you, but I'm doing that because I'm giving back to God and using that which He has given me. The Bible says, honor the Lord with thy substance. Your giving is not to the church, it's not to the preacher. Your giving, God receives it as unto himself. Amen? Amen? It's given to God. And as we do that, we are honoring him. Now notice what it says. Honor the Lord after you've paid the heat bill, the light bill, the electric bill, the dentist bill, the doctor bill, the sewage, and the plumbing, paid the car payment, the house payment, and you got everything else done. Kind of squeeze the Lord in there. <laughs> if you got anything left. And the average person says, I have nothing left. I can't afford to give. Well, friend, <laughs> that, that's very foolish. The, the fact is, you can't afford not to. And yeah. if you listen, if you stay with us during this stewardship program, you're going to see why. Now, notice what he said. He said, honor the Lord with thy substance and with the what? The first fruits of all thine increase. Now listen, folk. You stay right there. I'm going to jump over to Matthew 22 and read a verse of Scripture. 
a couple verses I've read for you over and over and over and over again. Then one of them, which was a lawyer, asked him a question, tempting him, said, Master, which is the great commandment in the law? <coughs> Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy mind, with all thy soul, and all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. Our first responsibility is to God. God wants to be first in your heart, first in your life. And as we read Proverbs 3, 9 and 10, the Bible says that we honor him as we give of our substance of our first fruits. Now, some have said, well, why does God need my money? <laughs> He's got all the wealth in the world. Well, here's the thing. If God wanted to, God could just send down an ocean of oil, a mountain of gold, or a diamond the size of Mount Everest, and he could finance his work that way. He could have an angel come down every month and, and bring riches with him and everything we need. But for some reason, God chose to allow us to have part in his work. And God chose to finance his work on earth through the offerings, tithe, and free will gifts of his people. That is God's way. It is not my way. It is not just a Baptist way. It is God's way. And he says that as you do, God is worthy of the best. So friend, he's to come before, literally before anything else. I'm going to show you something. Look with me. I'll turn here too. Mark's Gospel in chapter 12. And in Mark chapter 12, we see an interesting incident in the life of our Savior in verses 41 and following. And it says this, And Jesus set over against the treasury, and beheld how the people cast money into the treasury. Have you ever seen that before? You don't think God's interested in what you give? You know, I know preachers who, when the offering's taken up, they'll come down there and they'll they'll pick it up and they'll they'll go through it and well now come up boy, they're gonna pass it again. <laughs> and I've been to meetings where they've done that sometimes three times. Oh my. <laughs> I've never been that kind of pastor, so don't worry about that. But friend. God does. Jesus is interested in what we're giving. And the Bible says he sat over against the treasury and he watched how much money they put in the treasury. Well, dear friend, that hasn't changed. God cares what we do with that he's given unto us. Amen. Now, the fact is, not only does he care, but the Bible says one day we're going to have to account. You're a steward. Now, listen. Turn with me to the book of 2 Corinthians, and there, chapter 5. And I'll try to wait till you get there before I, before I take off again. 2 Corinthians, in chapter 5. As slow as I'm going, you might, you might get there before me. <laughs> chapter 5. Okay. These are two, verses 10 and 11, of the most important verses you'll find in the book of 2 Corinthians. Here's what it says. Paul speaking to Corinthian believers. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in the body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men, but we are made manifest unto God. A friend, understand something. The Bible says the day is coming when we must appear before the judgment seat, literally the Bema seat. Now turn back to the book of Romans. And there in Romans, we're going to go to chapter 14 and verses 10 through 12. And he says this. But why dost thou judge thy brother? Why dost thou stand not thy brother? For we must all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. 
As it was written, as I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, every tongue shall confess, so that every one of us shall account of himself to God. Romans 14, 10 through 12. Now what that means is this. One day, I'm going to stand before the Lord. The Bible says, and this is a fearful thought, we must account for every idle word. Our deeds, our actions, our inactions, our thoughts, our intents, our motives. I will give account to God for what he's given me of my time, my talent, and my treasure. I got a hold of that very early on. <coughs> and the one thing that I wanted, I referred to Luke 19. In Luke 19, there's an incident where subjects are called to give an account to their master. And in Luke 19, in verses 15 and following, it says, And it came to pass when he was returned, having received the kingdom, he commanded these servants to be called unto him to whom he had given the money, that he might know how much everyone had gained by trading. The verse came saying, Lord, thy pound hath gained ten pounds. And he said unto him, Well, thou good and faithful servant, because thou hast been faithful in very little, have thou authority over ten cities. The second came, saying, Lord, thy pound hath gained five pounds. And he said, Likewise unto him, Be thou also over five cities. In another place he says, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. And as I pondered my appearance before the Lord, and that day when my eyes shall behold the king. The one thing that I have desired above all else is that I could see that smile and hear him say, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. That's why I don't quit. That's why I'm who I am and right now and why I'm still going on at this point in my life. God has given me a calling. He's given me a responsibility. He said, occupy till I come. And so that I'm doing, my friend, is not just me. One day, you're going to count. Now, here's the thing I've seen in the Bible from cover to cover. All those who know the Lord want to give back unto God. In Genesis chapter 4, if you'll go there with me real quick, if you need to, maybe you don't need to. Maybe I've read it enough, and you've read it enough that you know exactly what it is. But in Genesis chapter 4, the Bible says, and in the process of time, verse 3, it came to pass that Cain brought of the first fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord. And Abel, he also brought of the first things of the flock and the fat thereof. These were the first two sons of Adam and Eve, and we see that one of the first things they're doing is wanting to honor God with their substance. One was a farmer, the other was an animal husbandry person, and, and one brought of the fat of the flock, the other brought of the goods of the ground, but they wanted to give back something unto God. Have you ever felt in your heart so blessed of God that you wanted to give back something unto Him? And so, friend, these first two men were givers. The Bible doesn't say a lot about how much they gave and such, but it says that they came with an offering. Now, they weren't the only ones that did it. Turn over to the book of Genesis, and we want to go to chapter 14. And this is an incident in the life of uh, Abraham. And the Bible tells us how that uh, Abraham was uh, called to go into combat, in the battle that ensued, he and his servants fought against great odds, and God gave them victory. And the Bible says in verse number 18, And Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought forth bread and wine. He was the priest to the Most High God, and he blessed him. He blessed Abraham. Blessed be Abraham, the Most High God, possessor of heaven and earth. Listen. And he blessed the Most High God, which hath delivered thine enemies into thy hand. And he gave him tithes of all. This is the first mention of tithe in the Bible. Now listen. Somebody said, well, I'm a New Testament believer. 
you know, we don't do storehouse tithing. That tithing was under the law. We're not under the law. No, tithing started a long time before the law was ever given. This is Abraham. And Abraham, before all those youngins came along and Israel became a nation, before the law was ever given, before they were in a nation, Abraham was giving one-tenth of his wealth to the priest of God. Look with me to the book of Genesis. And we're going to see another incident in chapter 28. This still is long before the law was ever given. And in Genesis chapter 28, this is the grandson of Abraham. Verse 20 through 22. And Jacob vowed a vow, saying, If God be with me, and will keep me in this way that I go, and will give me bread to eat and raiment to put on, so that I come again to my father's house in peace. Then shall the Lord be my God, and this stone which I have set a pillar shall be God's house. Now listen. And of all that thou shalt give me, I will surely give thee the tenth. Who do you suppose taught him to do that? granddad. And Jacob said, if God will be my God and help me and deliver me, I will serve him and I'm going to give the tenth unto God. Now, later, look with me to Leviticus. And there, Leviticus chapter 27. Now, my friends, this is under the law. When the law was instituted and they began to learn how to worship God and their worship of God, they were taught this in Leviticus 27 20. And all the tithe of the land, whether of the seed of the land or of the fruit of the trees, is the Lord's. It is holy unto the Lord. I think I'm going to preach this sermon again next week for those who weren't here this morning. <laughs> Do you hear this? That 10% is God's, and the Bible says it's holy unto the Lord. Now, how many of you would be so brave as when the offering plate is passed to say, mm, somebody put in, let's see, look at this, look at this wad of money. And you throw a five in and take out that handful of money. Anybody want to come up here and take it? You'd be stealing from God, and you would not want to do that, would you? You'd bring a curse upon yourself. Friend, understand something. Do you understand this? The principle is laid down, sanctioned by Jesus, that the tithe belongs unto God. It's His. It's holy unto the Lord. Look at Malachi. Now, I'm going to get you Malachi in a few weeks. And we're going to look at this more in 10. But right now, just Malachi in chapter 3. By the way, it's the last book in the Old Testament folk, uh, Zechariah and Malachi, before Matthew. But now, Malachi chapter 3. We're going to be in 1 and 3. But now listen. Here the question is raised in verse number 8, and it says this. Will a man rob God? Yet you have robbed me. But you say, wherein have we robbed thee? He says, what? In tithes and offerings. Not just a tithe, but offerings. It's not just 10%. There were offerings, there were sacrifices. Now listen, this is what he said. You are cursed with a curse. For you have robbed me, even this whole nation. Bring me all the tithes into the storehouse. That there may be meat in my house. And prove me now herewith, saith the Lord, if I will not open to you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing that there shall not be room enough to receive. I'll rebuke the devourer for your sake. Well, I'm going to get into that in depth in the weeks ahead. But right now, I just want you to see something.